All right, we are looking at the passion of Paul. We're in Romans chapter 1, still kind of going through the introduction here of, uh, of Paul's uh, epistle to the church uh, in Rome. And uh, we said last week he introduced himself as being a, a bondservant, uh, a doulos, which would have been uh, shocking to his uh, Jewish listeners, as well as the Roman listeners, would have been great comfort to those uh, that were not Roman citizens that were actually doulos, slaves themselves. But uh, he is a slave uh, of Jesus Christ. And then he said he's been separated unto the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. And we said that that was a word that uh, uh, actually was very similar to the word Pharisee, or that we translate Pharisee, because the Pharisee was separated unto the law. Uh, and he says, I am no longer a Pharisee, but I've been separated unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see his heart for that uh, in this uh, introduction as we continue. But uh, I was reading a, uh, a little Snoopy's uh, uh, comic strip a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there's a caption there with uh, Linus throwing a stick for, uh, for Snoopy to retrieve, and uh, Snoopy's always got some interesting things to say, and he kind of ponders, as it seems, whether he'll actually chase the stick or not. Uh, then he, uh, he pauses a moment and says, uh, I want people to have more to say about me after I'm gone than he was a nice guy. He chased sticks. And, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of us, that may be all that's said about us in terms of the things of this world. They were really a nice person, and they spent their life chasing sticks, in a sense, just getting by. The Apostle Paul's life is not like that at all. He's got a passion for something, and his passion is for, we're going to see a plan to visit uh, the church here in Rome, but uh, certainly it's for preaching the gospel, and we need to see that, see his heart for that before we get into the powerful doctrinal statements that uh, uh, he'll continue in the second portion. Well, looks like it, uh, again, we're in chapter 1, uh, verses 8 to 12. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I may mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means, now at last, I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, uh, that I have often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the unwise. So I've kind of got five reasons Paul had a passionate plan to visit the church here in Rome. The first one is that uh, because of their faith. He's thankful for their faith. He says their faith is spoken of uh, in terms of the whole world. That would certainly be the, uh, the Western world or the world of the Roman Empire that Paul was traveling in and was familiar with. Uh, and he's thankful for, for them, as he is often those that he's ministering to. Now, keep in mind, he's never met them. He's never been there. Uh, uh, he has uh, uh, no direct contact with them. It's been months since he's even Skyped with his friends there. I mean, there's nothing, no letters. But he's been praying for them. Uh, and he's been hearing about their faith. Uh, and it's given him reason, uh, a passion to want to uh, minister to them. Notice it's for all the believers, not just for some of them, it's for uh, all of them. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul speaks about this idea of wanting to be with others to minister to them. And he says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, uh, the word of God. Mentioning again that uh, he thanks God for them without ceasing. Now, I don't know uh, what Paul's daily routine was like, but evidently there had to be some hours spent in prayer because it seems like every group he writes to, he makes reference to the fact that he's praying for them all the time. Uh, and we'll see uh, that's not just a, a figure of speech. Uh, secondly, he, he planned to visit again based on his prayers. We see that in verse 9, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers to continually to be praying for someone. And again, Paul's prayer is all built around intercession. Uh, certainly, there's the, uh, it's not just a request he's making. There's real sincerity. Uh, he says in verse 9, for God is my witness. I don't think he says that uh, lightly uh, to say that God is my witness. I really am praying for you guys. 
uh, all the time. It's not just a rhetorical phrase. Uh, he says, notice also in verse 9, whom I serve with my spirit. His, uh, his service to the Lord. He uses an interesting word there. It's uh, latero in the Greek. And it means a, a religious service as in a priest. So uh, basically he's saying that when I'm serving the Lord, I look at it as it's actually worship uh, unto the Lord. He uses the same phrase in Romans 12, 1, when he says, I be beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Service is the same word, and it's why in the NIV, which gives you kind of the thought, as opposed to a word-by-word -word translation, but a thought-by-thought -thought translation, they translate it your reasonable act of worship. Paul saw himself as praying for other people, having a heart for other people, serving other people uh, as a real act of worship. And one of the things that we'll, I hope we get in studying the epistle, we'll learn the great doctrines of our faith and so forth, but we'll see that Paul certainly was an apostle. Certainly he was a great missionary. Certainly he was a great evangelist. This guy was a pastor, I mean, in establishing these churches, and he's got a real heart for the people. So he makes reference here to his spirit. Uh, I want to come because of what's in my spirit. Again, it's not a reference to the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not capitalized. There's no personal uh, pronoun uh, there. It's not the spirit. It's uh, his own spirit. And that's in contrast to uh, speaking of the motivation of Paul's heart. It's in he wants to do it according to his spirit as opposed to according to the flesh, uh, according to, uh, uh, again, his sin nature. Uh, there's no, nothing carnal about it. Uh, he's not self-promoting about it. <laughs> there, there are guys that, uh, that go to visit other Christians that are in great need so that they can get their picture taken with them so they can look good on their next fundraising letter. Uh, the Apostle Paul, if you weren't aware of that, the Apostle Paul uh, is not like that. Uh, uh, he's, all, he's wanting to come simply because his life is submitted to the will of God and he's got a heart for the people. Again, look at verse 10, making request if by some means... Now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Paul's life is submitted to, uh, to the will of God. Uh, and as we study and read further, we're going to find out that uh, there is a hindrance that keeps Paul from coming. And that hindrance is just his own busyness. He's so busy out preaching the gospel and minister, he can't get there. He can't find the time to get there. And he accepts that as being the will of God. But also it's more than that because he's, he uses the phrase, by some means. Uh, he's basically he's saying, nobody's bought me a ticket yet. Uh, I don't have the time and I don't have the resources. And I'm kind of accepting that as being the will of God. Otherwise, uh, I would be there. And he's not frustrated by that at, at all. Uh, there's probably a lot of things that we would like to do, uh, maybe for the Lord, uh, but apparently it's not the will of God because there just isn't the resources. We do believe in the uh, Chuck Smith 101 proverbial saying where God guides, uh, God provides. Well, let me ask you, how many of you would like to take a, a, a tour to Israel sometime and see all the sites there? We'd like to go to, wouldn't that be wonderful we all go? Okay, how many of you have, have the money to be able to do it? See, that's, that's a lot less people. That's what Paul's saying here. <laughs> you know why you don't have the money? It's not the will of God for you to go. But uh, that would be Paul's translation. I, you know, again, I, I find this interesting that Paul is this practical, you know. He's not just saying, Man, I'm going to come to you. I'm just trusting the Lord. I have no idea how I'm going to get there. I'm just headed down the road. You know, there, there's something to be said by, by having God's leading and doing things in faith. But Paul here says, my life is submitted to the will of God. I'd sure like to go, but it, there's a hindrance that's keeping me from coming. Again, he'll say later, it's because I'm so busy out preaching the gospel. But it's also, if I had the means, then I would know it was God's will and I would come. But he planned on come. He wants to come. Uh, and we know that eventually he is able to go to Rome. And I don't know how God put it to him. He might have said this, Paul, you're going to be able to go to Rome, and I've got it all worked out. In fact, I've arranged for the Roman government to cover all of your costs and all of your expenses. Not only that, is it all paid for. There's a little ocean Mediterranean cruise involved in this whole thing. You're going to get to make a nice little stop. In fact, you're going to get some little surfing lessons on the way right off the shore of Malta there. And not only that, once you finally, then I mentioned the private security guard I'm going to provide for you for this particular trip. Uh, but not only that, once you arrive, you're not just going to see the city. I'm going to bring you before Nero himself where you can preach the gospel. Are you ready for your trip, Paul? 
Absolutely. By the way, you're going to get arrested and go as a prisoner. But uh, anyway, that's how Paul does get there. God does provide, according to his will, a way for Paul to get to the church at Rome eventually. Uh, the third thing about his passion to visit them, he says so they could, he could impart a spiritual gift. Look at verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together uh, with you. Now, Paul is not the giver of spiritual gifts. That's the Holy Spirit. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, certainly every believer receives the Holy Spirit into his own heart and life. Uh, and God does give us spiritual gifts, and Paul has uh, several lists of them uh, in his epistles. So Paul is not the giver of spiritual gifts. So when he says, I want to impart a spiritual gift, he's talking about one of his gifts that he would like to impart, and it's for the purpose of establishing them in the faith. Now, Paul had uh, certainly a lot of gifts. Uh, he's certainly a gifted evangelist, uh, certainly a gifted teacher. Uh, he uh, prayed and healed many people, uh, and, uh, and we can read about his exploits and adventures in, in the book of Acts. But since this is the gift that would establish them in the faith, at least it's my opinion that he's got to be talking about a gift of teaching. Uh, that's how we get established in the faith. It's through the teaching uh, of the Word of God. You can imagine coming to faith in Jesus Christ and never get any teaching, never having a Bible, uh, and uh, just the desperate condition, how easy it would be for you to deceive, be deceived, to be condemned by the enemy, and just be not equipped for the life that God's called you to. Uh, Paul mentions in writing to the church at Ephesus there in Ephesus 4.11 that uh, God has given the church, apostles, teachers, prophets, and so forth. He says, and it's for the equipping of the saints for the service that God has called them to. I think that's what Paul has in mind here. So he's very passionate about wanting to come to them because he's got a real investment in them. He's been praying for them. Uh, and if you want to have a heart for someone that you don't now, pray for them on a regular basis. As you invest in them, it's amazing how God will change that relationship. He can change a relationship, apparently, with somebody you've never even met before. You've just heard about them. You've just heard about their faith. We've got a bunch of uh, postcards back there with missionaries' pictures and, on it. And if you get one of them and get their letters and you start praying for the people that you've never met... Uh, there in, uh, in one of the places where they're at. It's amazing how God can give, give you a heart for them as you invest something of your own time and energy and, and effort, efforts. I hesitate to tell this story, but uh, it was BC days. That means before I came to the Lord, before Christ. But I went to school in uh, Southern California for a while in Pasadena. And uh, one of the pastimes among the students at this Christian college that we could have been kicked out of the school for uh, was to, there was a little, a little uh, racetrack nearby called Santa Anita. And uh, so uh, some of these guys would go over to the racetrack once in a while for their love of horses, of course. And uh, anyways, I went along. Uh, you know, I'm a student, man. I want a scholarship. And, you know, I'm just playing ball and trying to stay in school and keep my grades up. And and kind of roll along with things. I mean, I'm, you know, Sunday, my, my hardest time was Sunday night when the cafeteria was closed. This is the one time the cafeteria was closed. And we'd, we'd go to the, yeah, a place in Pasadena where you could buy a bag of chicken for 50 cents, you know, and that was, that was dinner. So I'm just kind of describing the student lifestyle but, uh, that I was in. And uh, so anyway, so, you know, we go to the racetrack. I've never been there before. And uh, I think they're all, uh, it is beautiful and awesome, the horses and the color and all that stuff. And uh, we're not just in the cheap seats. You stand. There, there ain't no seats. You just stand. You're down near the, near the track. And uh, so we, you know, we're watching, and these guys are placing bets, like hard-earned money on, on these horses and stuff, these guys that I'm with. And, and uh, I think they're crazy. And then when the, you know, the, the bell goes off and these horses start going and the guys announce, it's just like you've seen on TV. It's a little different live, though. Uh, the, the place erupts. People are going crazy, crazy, screaming. And I just think these people are all insane. You know, watch this whole thing. And then, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, that was interesting, a very interesting experience. And then, you know, my buddy that I'm with said, listen, uh, you know, you're not spending a lot of you, but two bucks on a horse to show. That means he finishes first, second, or third. You win something. You don't have to pick the winner. You know, there's a Willie Shoemaker. He's the greatest disc jockey uh, you know, in the world. Not disc, the greatest jockey in the world. Put your money on him. Whatever he's on, he's going to finish at least in the top three. You know, you can't lose your money. You know, well, how much do I win? Not uh, 50 cents. 
I'm gonna, it's going to pay 250 or 260 or something. Okay, uh, two dollars, you know, buys me a few hamburgers, but I'm going to risk it. And uh, you know, here I am. The bell rings, and guess what? I was just as crazy as everybody else. Man, I had money on that. I was yelling and screaming, all like I, my boys had something to do with getting that horse around the track until it came through. <laughs> Hallelujah! I won 60 cents. You know. <laughs> You know, when you invest something, it's amazing how it changes your, your perspective on things. Paul's been praying. He says, he says, God is my witness. I prayed with you without ceasing. And uh, he's, he's pretty passionate about wanting to come. And he wants to come. The fourth reason, he says, is for their mutual edification. That's just a $5 word. It means they're both going to get built up in the faith. Paul, apparently, the Apostle Paul, the writer of the Bible, the Apostle Paul, apparently believes that being with these young believers would be a tremendous blessing to him. Apparently, he believes that he will actually learn from them. It's for their mutual benefit. And, uh, and of course, that should always be our, our perspective on things. I mean, you know, yeah, God can use us, especially if we've walked with the Lord for a while to minister to somebody else, to help them and so forth uh, in their faith in Jesus Christ. But it should always be in what can I, what can I learn from them? We should always be willing and be able to, uh, to learn from, uh, from anyone. I'm going to, Kathy and I will jump on, a, on an airplane on a Tuesday morning and head back to Japan. And this is for the annual uh, Calvary Chapel Pastors Retreat that uh, we do every year there. And uh, Tatsuhiko wishes he could be on the plane going with me. He's been there uh, for many of these, and we go up to a retreat center. It's up in the mountains. It's fall colors. It's beautiful. There's a river flowing. We hope it's not freezing to death, but sometimes it is. But we have a great time just packed out in these uh, little log cabins, and the fire's going and the whole thing And uh, with these guys, and they come from all over Japan, and about 40 of them. And, and uh, wow, it's quite the responsibility to think that I'm, I'm there to teach them. Uh, and... Uh, uh, this time I'll, I'll kind of do the bulk of the teaching, and there's been times when I've done all of it. Uh, you know, I'm under no delusion that somehow uh, I'm, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm there to somehow teach all of them and not learn from them. I mean, I always go and I always learn from the folks that I'm, I'm ministering to. And, we, and, and uh, you've been blessed by that, actually, just being in this facility, because <laughs> space is tight in Japan, and they learn how to multi-use everything. Uh, the, the reason that uh, my, my uh, office could be a, a nursery for five years was because of being uh, in Japan. The reason that we could have a kitchen that could be a bookstore, that could be a Sunday school class, <laughs> is because of the, some of the times I spent in Japan. One of the reasons we spend about a tenth, a tenth of what most churches spend on electrical cost every month is because of these Mitsubishi split air sea systems that cost almost nothing to run. That's because of my being in Japan. Sometimes it's very practical things. Sometimes it's very inspirational things. But I, I can tell you, if you have that attitude in ministering to others that if God can use you to bless somebody, great. If God can use you to teach somebody something, great. But always be open to being taught yourself. Uh, again, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 8 to the church there in Thessalonica, he says, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And that's the, the if is the conditional since it is so. Uh, so uh, in NIV it says, we really live because you are standing uh, fast in the Lord. Uh, for what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? In other words, Paul is saying that uh, real living is when you're able to help somebody else walk uh, in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you find out that they're doing pretty good, you get pretty excited when you're in your own worship time with the Lord. <laughs> that might be a hint. You know, if uh, worship isn't really exciting to you, uh, then uh, maybe there's something missing there. But apparently Paul says, I get pretty excited. In the presence of the Lord. I can't thank you guys enough for the joy I have. In the presence of my God. Why? Because you're walking with the Lord. And God in his uh, mercy and grace allowed me to have something to do with it. Uh, John in 3 John uh, um, uh, 1-4 says that. Um, uh, I want you to know. Oh, I'm, uh, I'll get it. Can I get the picture in my mind first? Up on the really, but basically he says. I have no greater joy than to hear 
that the, my children are walking in the truth. A few uh, parents and grandparents can say amen to that. Probably no greater joy, <laughs> joy, whatever else has happened in your life. Uh, you can go through a lot, man, if your kids are walking with the Lord or your kids are uh, uh, grandkids. Of course, John, he's not even talking about that. He's just talking about his children, people that he's had something to do with in a spiritual sense. He says, man, there's no greater joy uh, than to have been involved in somebody's life to some degree, and they're, and they're doing well in the Lord. It just, uh, uh, it means the world. It means, uh, uh, it means everything. This idea of uh, mutual edification, blessing others that you might be blessed is just so, uh, so critically uh, in, uh, important. You know, we took the, uh, took the kids out surfing, you know, last week and stuff, and, uh, you know, it was a workout. Yeah. Pastor Kevin was so exhausted, he didn't even make it to church the next day. He's homesick in bed. But, uh, the, uh, we were out in the water for a couple hours, you know, because we're shoving them off and swimming and grabbing them. Matt's out there. We kind of had the, the lifeguard station for all the kids. But, you know, we, you know, I, I've, you know, I've surfed enough. So, I mean, you know, it's, I enjoy it. I, you know, I usually surf by myself. And, you know, it's fun. It's a good workout. You know, I, I feel better. I like PK's expression. It's hydrotherapy. You know, it's like... <laughs> Uh, my wife says, I'm a nicer person <laughs> when I can get in the water once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it was a lot more fun, you know, seeing those kids and seeing the excitement. And I have to tell you, if you've walked for, with the Lord for a while, hey, you know, find a young believer. Find somebody that uh, you can pray with, show how to pray, uh, show them how to read their Bibles, just the basic issues of uh, of your experiences in life, to be able to give yourself away. You're, you're the one that will be blessed uh, so, much, uh, so much more than them. We were at, a, I had to go a meeting this week. Don McClure is, uh, is here from the mainland, kind of, Don's kind of helped uh, uh, organize, and we've kind of restructured the uh, Calvary chapels around, around the country, and we were having this little meeting about some things that were going on, and uh, Don was just talking about taking over a church uh, uh, back, you know, 20 years ago that was an aging congregation. And uh, uh, lots, lots of senior citizens and so forth. And uh, he took it over and he kind of took them all aside and he met with them. And, and he said, uh, I want to ask you something. How many of you want to see your kids and your grandkids come to faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, they all did, of course. He goes, how many of you would like to see them come to faith in Jesus Christ in this church and attend this church with you? Oh, man, they were all excited about that. He goes, OK, what we're going to have to do is you're going to have to make some changes. I'm going to have to change the band. Uh, it's going to get louder, uh, and it's going to, you're not going to like it. So I'm just going to tell you, you know, the, the hymns and the organ and the piano are out. i got a band in here next week. I want you to put uh, earplugs in your ears. And then I want you to grin like this all the way through the worship like you enjoy it. I don't care if you hate it. Uh, and then I, I'm going to need you uh, to look around as these kids start to come in. And you see a single mom with a couple of kids Go up and ask to pray for her and give her 25 bucks because she's probably hurt the way you were when you were that age. But you're going to have to see yourself in a different role in this congregation if it's going to survive and if it's going to go on to the next generation. And he said, and we'll get a guy. He'll be a senior's pastor. He'll meet with you, have breakfast once a week. He'll minister your, your needs and all that. But when you come on in here on Sunday, it can't be about you anymore. This thing, the whole thing's got to change. Anybody in? And, and they were. They understood it. And... Uh, and God used them to, you know, again, reach a, a younger generation. Guess who was blessed the most? Uh, it was, it was that, that group of people. That's what Paul's uh, talking about here. We not only need to see his heart, uh, we need to learn from it as well. He was passionate. Paul's uh, fifth reason for his purpose, uh, being passionate about uh, uh, going to see them, uh, is described here in verse 14. He says, I am a, a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise uh, and to the unwise. So the Greeks, sir, is just another word for the Romans. The Romans had basically uh, adopted and borrowed the Greek culture. The Romans themselves have no culture. Uh, it's all from, uh, from the Greeks. Uh, and so they are referred to here as the Greeks. Who are the barbarians? Everybody else. Uh, to the Romans, the Jews were barbarians. It had nothing to do with education or culture or anything else. It just means you weren't one of them. So Paul's saying basically... I am a debtor <laughs> to the Romans and to everybody else uh, as well. And he says, and both to the wise and to the unwise, that is, those that have an education, those that don't have an education, I'm a debtor to all of them. Uh, and uh, writing to the church in Corinth, where he's writing this letter from, 
Later, he would say in 1 Corinthians 9, 20, to the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak, I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul was a guy that uh, he could sit there and uh, discuss things with the intellectuals on Mars Hill uh, there in Athens. Uh, he could go into the synagogue and, and debate uh, using the scriptures. Uh, he could sit down and meet with anybody and find a way to relate, find a way to adjust, find a way to change that people might relate to him in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says it because I have a debt to do so. Again, Paul's debt, in a sense, wasn't to these people that he was going to, that he's never met. His debt was to God. He couldn't get over the grace of God. He couldn't get over God's love for him. Uh, and because of that, he says, basically, I have a debt. It's to God. I can never repay him. So I'm going to take the debt of the love that he's given me. That's, that's the debt, by the way. He'll say that later in chapter 12. Oh, no man a debt other than the debt of love. So he says, I'm going to take the love that God's given me. That's the debt that I have. I can't pay it back to God. I'll do it in service like worship as I pour it into the hearts of other people. Is it because he had such a great love for the church there in Rome? He's never been there. Uh, he's never met them. Somebody asked uh, Hudson Taylor at one point in time, again, maybe arguably one, one of the greatest missionaries of the, uh, of the 19th century. He had uh, training and uh, sending out thousands uh, uh, to minister there in China with him. And uh, if you haven't had a chance uh, to read one of his biographies, it's uh, very inspiring. But at one point in time on one of his trips back to, uh, to Great Britain there, somebody asked him uh, about his going to China initially and answering the call of God. And they said something like, well, uh, well uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, God must have given you a great love for the Chinese people. And uh, he shook his head and says, no, I didn't go because I loved the Chinese. I went because I loved God. I mean, practically, he'd never met a Chinese person. It had nothing to do with why he went to China with, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went because he, because he loved God. Uh, and that's what the Apostle Paul is, uh, is saying here. It doesn't matter who they are, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, Paul didn't care. He felt like he had a debt, like he owed everybody something. And what he owed them was God's love. Paul's passion included, again, a plan to visit Rome because he was excited to see the believers because he's heard about their faith. He wanted to impart a spiritual gift. I believe it was teaching the word of God. They would be established in the faith. He knew it would be a blessing to himself if he went. He had a debt of love to repay, and he wanted to minister to everyone there. Secondly, Paul's passion was to preach the gospel uh, in Rome, verse 15. So as much as, uh, as is in me... I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. First, uh, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For in it, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, again, five reasons why he planned the trip. Three reasons uh, he's got uh, a passion to preach there. And the first one is that he is not ashamed of the gospel. And, uh, and of course, it's important that he says this because it's our tendency to be ashamed. Now, we wouldn't put it in such harsh terms, certainly. Uh, but uh, you would admit there are times when it seems like God has given you a golden opportunity to share the gospel with someone, whether it's that person that's trapped next to you for five hours on the airplane uh, or whatever it might be, a neighbor next door, uh, somebody in a class with you, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, there's often times when we see that the conversation uh, with our friend or family member could easily be steered towards the church or towards Christ and lead into sharing the gospel. And we see the opportunity to go. We see God opening the door before us. And why do we get the sweaty palms? Why, why, why do we get nervous about the whole thing? Uh, if, uh, if our mission in life was to talk about football in the NFL, uh, guys would be doing really good because they can walk up to a complete stranger. It doesn't matter. 
the guy's got a team jersey on, anything else, all he's got to say is, did you see that game? And they, it's just their best of friends, you know? Uh, you know, we could talk about the stock market even if we don't know anything about it. We just got to bluff it, just to, you know? It, it's interesting, you know, all these uh, areas of conversation. Uh, but man, when it comes to sharing the gospel, often we are ashamed. We would say that Paul certainly saw Rome as the center of the world. Uh, it was the center of law and, uh, and all that followed it. Uh, we mentioned the fact that their art was borrowed but appreciated uh, and their military, certainly the wonder of the world at that time. But as far as Paul was concerned, Rome was a city to be pitied. And that's because if you were to go through the, uh, Rome today, and you were to look at uh, uh, the city's ruins, you would find no hospitals. You would find no orphanages. You would find nothing that indicated that these people cared the least about the least among them because they didn't. Rome and its glory, again, even according to secular writers, uh, distracted from the inside because of their gross immorality. It was a, it was a culture that lived for themselves exalted self, sounding familiar, uh, and it destroyed itself uh, based on immorality uh, eventually. One writer said this, the pious aspirations and efforts of individuals never seem to have touched the conscience of the people. Rome had no conscience. She was a lustful, devouring beast, made more bestial by her intelligence and splendor. She had both of those things, but Paul pitied them because the gospel just had it penetrated into their culture, into their lives. When Paul preached in Jerusalem, it was the religious center of the world, and he was mobbed, and they wanted to kill him, if you remember that story from Acts. When he preaches in Athens there on the Aragopius on Mars Hill, uh, he is mocked, although a few listen to him. But here he is in Rome, the legislative center of the world, uh, and he was ready, uh, and he was ready to preach the gospel. And he says, I don't care what the outcome is. I can tell you one thing. I will not be ashamed of the gospel. And he's, he's going to preach it. It was the passion, certainly the passion of his life. Why? He says because of the power. He knew it could transform a person's life. It could completely change a person. You look around people today, and, and you know somebody, and they have a, a, a drug addiction or a drug problem. Why wouldn't we share the gospel with them? It may be their only hope. It can absolutely transform their lives. I, and I don't think we have a problem seeing that. Our problem is not seeing that everybody needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, uh, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. And that ass word assurance means that in deep conviction. When we came to you, Man, it wasn't just with words. We preached the gospel to you. It wasn't just with words, not merely with words, but it was with power because the gospel can change people's lives. It was with the Holy Spirit. It was with deep conviction, and that's how we need to deliver it as well, uh, with deep conviction, knowing that God has the power to change a person's life. Gospel means good news, uh, and it's good news because it can radically transform our lives. Paul says, secondly, that Preaching would be to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Now, we mentioned that this was his uh, MO. He would go to a major city, uh, believing that if he could establish a work there, the people in that city then could take it to the smaller towns and villages uh, around him. It seems to be, again, his, uh, the way he operated and planned things out under the leading and the directing of the Holy Spirit, but always to the Jew first, going to the synagogue if they had one. If they didn't have one, then he'd go to the place that the Jews in that community met because he could reason with them from the scriptures, prove that Jesus was the Messiah that was promised uh, and uh, predicted by the prophets, uh, and then move out from there. But I think the statement is a lot more than that. I think it's a recognition that the gospel is a Jewish message from the Jewish scriptures about a Jewish Messiah who died for the sins of the whole world in fulfillment of the Jewish prophets. And it's often forgotten, certainly it's been forgotten tragically uh, in church history. Paul's going to have a lot more to say about that in Romans 9, 10, uh, and 11. I mentioned uh, Hudson Taylor before. He had a tradition uh, at the beginning of each year. He had a friend of his back in Great Britain who had a ministry to, uh, to the Jewish people there uh, in England. Uh, and so on January 1, he would write his friend a, a card, say his name at the top, uh, and he would write uh, and quote this, 
and to the Jew first. And he would send an offering to this guy's ministry. And he did it, did it every year. Well, this guy would receive it then. Uh, sometime later, uh, he would take it out of the envelope, already knowing what it was. And then he would take out another letter and he would write to Hudson Taylor and to the Gentile also. And then he put the same money back in the envelope and send it right back to Hudson Taylor. And they did that for years. Both men realizing they had two different callings, uh, but the scripture was very clear. The gospel was for everyone. Uh, third thing about his preaching in the Passion, uh, notice it's the, gospel, uh, it's the gospel for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Uh, Paul's not ashamed. Uh, it's our tendency sometimes to be embarrassed, to be ashamed. Uh, but because of the power of God, he wasn't. And also because it was the righteousness that is from God. That is, it's, uh, it's God's righteousness that he's giving to us. In Philippians 3.9, he speaks of a righteousness which is through faith in Christ. Again, it's a righteousness that comes from God, that's given to us. It's not our own trying to earn our righteousness. It's coming from him. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, there he says that God made him, Jesus, God made him who had no sin to become sin, a sin offering uh, for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, again, not a human righteousness, but the righteousness of God. And the gospel, he says, is revealed through Christ, again, because he suffered uh, for us. Verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Notice it's from faith to faith. It's by, again, the idea of faith alone. Cranefield, in his uh, commentary on Romans, says, The sense of the whole sentence may be set out as follows. For in it, the gospel, as it is being preached, a righteous status which is God's gift, is being revealed and so offered to men, a righteous status which is altogether by faith. And then he concludes with Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous will live by faith. Radical message, radical message. A message that uh, was preached by Paul in the early ch church, a message that was then completely lost for several centuries, <coughs> unfortunately, through, uh, through the church there in Western Europe. I mentioned Martin Luther last week and the fact that his, his reading and studying uh, the book of Romans changed his life and we could say therefore changed uh, Western civilization. His son uh, actually wrote about the experience of his father uh, in the Rudolstadt, Germany. There's a glass case that holds a letter written by Luther's younger son. I just had to say that word Rudolstadt, but uh, it sounds like a pastry to me, but apparently it's a place in Germany. And... Uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Luther uh, wrote this. He said, in the year 1544, my dearest father, in the presence of us all, narrated the whole story of his journey to Rome. He acknowledged with great joy that in that city, through the spirit of Jesus Christ, he had come to the knowledge of the truth of the everlasting gospel. It happened this way. As he repeated his prayers on the ladder and staircase, the words of the prophet Habakkuk came suddenly to his mind, the just shall live by faith. Thereupon he ceased his prayers, returning to Wittenberg, and took this as his chief foundation of all of his doctrine. To Luther up until that time, and it was taught, the idea of the righteousness of God was bad news. The righteousness of God means you're, you're going to get judged because you cannot live. You better try, but you're probably not going to be able to live up to the righteousness of God. So when, when he reads this, what Paul is saying is that the righteousness of God is a gift that he gives and that he gives it by faith. Uh, and then he, re, he, he realizes that he quotes his passage by, uh, by Habakkuk. Man, the light goes off. I mean, his, his whole life of depression and despair and everything he was trying to do to have a relationship with God in his own efforts uh, was uh, not biblical. And, uh, and would never lead him into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul understands this, certainly. Paul had, was, had a passion for preaching because he realized it's possible for men and women to stand sinless before God. It's possible for men and women and children to know for sure that they have eternal life and to be free from the frustration of trying to earn righteousness and earn a place in heaven and that the sole requirement is faith, uh, and it's faith alone. That's why Paul said it's good news. 
again, we, you know, if, if, if you grow up understanding this idea of grace and so forth, uh, you know, you, you may not even have a, the appreciation that maybe somebody that's grown up under a religious system where you have to earn it. You know, you, you have to earn it. And, uh, and of course, you can't. Uh, it can be further from the truth. Paul was motivated by his confidence in the gospel. He knew that it could change uh, people's lives. I think that's why most of us are, are, are here today. But it's so easy to forget, isn't it, after a period of time. And, uh, uh, you know, I've just, you know, every time, you know, I, I mentioned running a guy at the beach the other day and listens on the radio and stuff. And, you know, and he was asking me about my testimony. I guess he'd heard part of it. And uh, it's just easy to forget. I mean, I've been walking with the Lord over 30 years, 30 something years. And it's like, man, it's, it, it's easy to forget how horrible my life was before and how, how desperate my life, if I were still alive, would have been today if God hadn't intervened with his grace and, uh, and, changed, and changed my life. <clears throat> and I told him, you know, it's, it's like sometimes I just got to share a little bit of my testimony once in a while because I think the, the people walk in and they just suppose that Kathy and I have grown up in church and always known the Lord and it just couldn't be further from the truth. God radically changed and transformed our lives uh, as he has yours and will continue. And therefore, we shouldn't be ashamed uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had a passion. He wanted to minister to a group of people he'd never met before. But he certainly invested in them because he'd been praying for them without ceasing. And certainly we could learn from that. He believed that God had given him a spiritual gift, and he probably had many, as he's given you at least one uh, that you can share and impart to others. And as you do that, you'll actually be the one that's blessed. Why should you do that? Because you'd understand that you have a great debt of love that we owe God, that we can only pay as we minister to others. That minister, that serving, he says, is actually a form of worship. And then Paul had a passion to preach the gospel. Why? Because he wasn't ashamed of it. He knew it was uh, powerful enough to change every person that would accept it and receive it. Paul didn't want his life to be known as a really nice guy that chased sticks. You know, he just, he wanted something more in life. Sometimes we, we talk about climbing the ladder to, of success, getting to the top and realizing it's leaning against the wrong building. You know, we can, we can spend a, a lifetime, you know, doing things that uh, in the end is just kind of stuff. And uh, we all got to earn a living. God's got a calling for all of us wherever we're at. Uh, he puts us in con a context where uh, he can use our, our life. Uh, but we want to make sure that, that we use the life. We used to, uh, I remember uh, hearing the, uh, one of the uh, bands we used to bring over back in some of the early days we were doing outreaches and stuff, and uh, 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 they were talking about having a crossover song. Uh, that is, they're a Christian band, but their song crossed over uh, into the regular pop world and became uh, uh, you know, pretty, pretty popular, successful, and so forth. Uh, but he made the, the statement, the lead singer of the band, said, but uh, there, there's no point in crossing over if you don't take the cross over. <laughs> you know, and that, I think that's true in uh, all of our, you know, jobs where we work a secular job. It's important to be there, but man, we want to be taking the gospel with us each and every day. I pray that as we go through and understand the doctrinal truths of the gospel, we'll certainly continue to not just go, man, that Paul, he was an awesome guy. I just pray that we would go, I want to be that guy. You know, I, I want to have that heart. I want to see that way. I want my life to be used uh, in the same way. Uh, all, again, submitted to the context of God's will. What a, what a tremendous uh, man of God Paul was, and we pray that uh, his writing will have a great influence over us as we study it together. In the secret, in the quiet.
shall be grown. 